But we talk a lot about FROs and what they do. We don't actually talk a lot about convergent research in the nonprofit and how we function. So this is a, the first public talk about what convergent research actually does day to day. Uh, we're a nonprofit, turns out. And we launch an upright focused research organizations. It's that simple. <laughs> Um, Adam talked about FROs, but these are these time-limited efforts to tackle specific technical projects. Um, think of them as a critical mass of people over a critical mass of time trying to build something really important and hard where you need engineering and cross-disciplinary efforts. You need one person coordinating towards that goal. They're startup inspired. If you've worked at a 20-person startup, that is what it looks and feels like. At least I think it is. They know better. Um, but what does our success look like? You know, our success is not uh, brain mapping. Our success is not neuromodulation. It is all of these things. It is creating scaled revolutions. If we pick a project, we want to fundamentally change that field. We want adoption of that technology in labs. We want adoption of that technology in for-profit settings and in non-profit settings. Um, and so 10 or 15 years after any one of our projects, we should see follow-on funding. We should see startups. We should see industrial actors. They should be used everywhere. Brain mapping should be a thing that everybody in neuroscience can do. And that is how we will know if we've been successful across each one of our projects. Um, as an example, I will give you a non-neurotech example. Cultivarium is one of our first two pros, and they're working with non-model organisms. Um, there are just Millions of microbes of different kinds across the planet. They do all sorts of things. They fix methane. They eat rocks. They produce proteins. They could be really cool and really useful, uh, but we don't use them. We use these four, right? Um, we're not using what is abundant in nature because it's very hard to do in academic settings. It's very hard to do in, in industry settings. It takes a lot of time to figure out how to use any one microbe and so no one's incentivized to work with a new microbe. They go to one of the ones that already exists. Very easy. So if Cultivarium is successful, it will look like the ability for researchers and for companies to say, hey, this microbe makes a protein that's really important for this disease. I'm just going to experiment directly with that. Um, and this will fundamentally change you know, climate projects. It will fundamentally change uh, health projects, medicine, um, geo -mi or mining via uh, microbes, maybe even help us go to Mars. Um, so if this piece is successful, there are a lot of downstream impacts. And when those happen, that is how we will know that we've been successful. Right, but what do we actually do to do that? Um, Adam is an expert at this, but this idea of scientific road mapping or bottleneck analysis. You know, we want to find not the next incremental project. We're not going to work on a COVID vaccine. We're probably not even going to work on mRNA vaccines. We look closer and closer to the trunk of the tech tree to figure out what will enable many downstream effects. Um, one of the ways to do this is look at really important problems. You know, as uh, Andrew talked about, we're looking at mental illness. Um, we're making, looking at safe AI. Uh, we're looking at consciousness. We're looking at uh, nerve diseases or spinal cord injuries. Um, and we need to improve neuroscience to do any of those. And then there is this shared constraint, which is that it's really hard to map neural circuits right now. And so the solution is E11 bio. So we, we go about different areas of science. We've done this in pandemic preparedness. We've done this in neurotech. We've done this in alternative proteins. We've done this um, in climate to find these projects that we think will fundamentally unlock many downstream effects. OK, so we found like a cool area where we think that there's a fundamental problem. Uh, we need to know that if it's fro-shaped, this fundamental bottleneck. Uh, it never comes to us as a fro-shaped problem because people in their academic labs right now aren't thinking, do what I want one day, I want to make a fro. No, they're thinking, hey, I have another paper. I have another idea. I want to pursue that. Or maybe the thing that I want is to form a startup company. How do I find market? How do I find product market fit? How do I find the right shape there? No one's thinking, what is the fundamental technology that will unbottleneck my field? And so we spend a lot of time with 
um, scientists and experts in the space figuring out what the right flow shape project is. Uh, we did this a bunch in pandemic preparedness, specifically for UVC, and it was hard. There's a ton of things that you can do in far UVC that would help prevent pandemics. Um, far UVC is a type of light, it's on the far side of the UV spectrum, uh, that is detrimental to viruses and to bacteria, but it is not detrimental to humans. So we could do something like deploy it at scale in hospitals, on cruise ships, in conference centers, and it would reduce transmission, hopefully. Um, but there's a ton of work to do. So we roadmap the space and we say, hey, here is a bottleneck. Is this bottleneck actually more of a like, directed research like program, like a DARPA program would be? Is this actually a series of papers that someone should be doing in their lab? Is this a company? So we're only looking for these problems that fit our problem statement. So we've done this, right? We have a problem. We have a solution. It is a fro-shaped solution. We think it's going to be super impactful. We now need to get scientific credibility for the solution. Um, this goes in like several different stages. Basically, someone sends us an abstract or we request an abstract. And we're like, hey, this is probably cool. Let's go talk to the experts in this field. And we say, hey, is this the right idea? Is this the right direction? How would you change it? We work with the founders to iterate, to come to a longer proposal that we think is really robust. Um, and we bring it to funders, and we get funders to agree. And then we write like a 60-page document that outlines what will happen over the length of the fro, what milestones they want to achieve, how they will do it. And we go through a scientific review process. I think that something that is different for us than traditional academic scientific review is that we're not looking for consensus. We're looking for people to say, hey, this is really important. This is really impactful. I think that this way of doing it is physically possible. I think that this is a, uh, a good way to go forward. Sometimes we work with you know, feedback from that scientific review process, and we go out and we find another co-founder, or we change the direction of the project. But we're looking to find something that is really well scientifically vetted as something worth making this large financial and time effort to doing. I think this is actually probably the most important thing that we do, though, is we're trying to act as a marketplace, a place for these really impactful ideas, these really amazing founding teams, and funders to come together. We cannot do that without our funder relations. We cannot do it without donors and the government being excited about solving these types of bottlenecks. And so being a central location where we can work on all pieces of this puzzle is probably the most important thing that we do. Um, so we talked about good ideas. The second piece of that is founding teams. We have amazing scientists who are proposing ideas. Sometimes they come fully fleshed out. I have a CSO, I have a CEO, they both have startup experience, they like understand how they're gonna run this mission, and it's easy. Sometimes they're like, hey, I've been a postdoc and I haven't done like work in a startup before. I have no idea how to do that. Or, hi, I'm a tenured professor. I understand how my academic work works. It works really well, I get it. But they need help running and operating like a startup. And so we spend a lot of time helping teams flesh out their founding teams. Um, we actually, uh, Bill Busa is a wonderful example. His project Eve came in uh, from UNC. Jeff DiBerto was on the, was a grad student in the lab it came from. He has an amazing scientific mind. They're gonna do amazing things. He wasn't gonna lead the project. So we went out and we did a CEO hunt. We interviewed tons of people. We brought them in. We like, did working sessions with the founding team until Bill was there and Bill is absolutely crushing this project. Okay, so the third piece is funders. Um, this is why that scientific review is really important. This is why Adam's work is really important. Um, the thing that funders want is they want to have impact. They want to change the world and they want to make a difference, but they need to trust us to do that. And so a lot of what we're doing is building credibility for convergent research through being really diligent, through having really good governance and oversight through picking the most impactful projects we can pick and having the best scientists. Um, and then we're going out and soliciting funders who are interested in particular problems, who are interested in bottlenecks, to help support their work. Um, and this is just such a crucial piece of this puzzle. Without funders, none of this would happen. 
Um, okay, and a very brass tax tactical version of this. Uh, convergent research, we are a 501c3. We have some subsidiaries, which are LLCs. The cool thing about this is that it means they get to borrow our nonprofit status. I'm the only one who files a 990. I am responsible for ensuring that they all meet all of the nonprofit requirements. They can focus on doing science. We provide some governance and oversight. This is really important with these funder relations. When they're giving these very large check size, it's important that they understand what product they're going to have. Um, we also do want this to be startup inspired. The point is not that I, with no scientific background at all, am sitting telling people how to do their jobs. I am not telling them what, product, what partners to have. I'm not telling them how to do tech transfer. I want that to be with Andrew and Sumner, who know best. What we're doing is we're providing the overall structure and kind of representing the funder on the board. Oh, someone asked about milestones earlier. This is where a lot of this comes in. So the, the proposals have uh, milestones outlined. It's clear what we want to achieve in two years. It's clear what we want to achieve in five years. And it's the board's responsibility to provide governance and oversight as we work towards those. Um, if something happens, it is the board's responsibility to figure out how to pivot. They don't want to do HR is what I was saying. Uh, because everyone rolls up into our 990, we do all of the finance and accounting. We help them with budgets. We have professional staff who are uh, people experts, who are HR experts, who are finance experts. And we provide that as a service to each of the pros so they can focus on science and they can focus on their operational milestones and not on running a nonprofit. I think the, one of the most important parts of this is that they're all going to generate IP. They're going to generate um, sort of like knowledge and they're going to generate patents and there's going to be spinoffs and nonprofits. So we put in place a structure that hopefully allows them to pick the transition pathways that are most impactful for that technology. If there's a research tool, academic labs should be able to use it. Um, if it's a drug, it needs to be patented and commercialized in order for it to go anywhere. So each project will look at its impact pathways and pick what the best pathways are going forward. Um, tech transfer sometimes gets a really bad name. Our goal is not to have a tech transfer office that maximizes patents or creates X revenue. It is to figure out how to enable very specific projects to have very specific outcomes. Um, Adam showed the slide first. I was very upset when I saw it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we have projects across many different spaces. We are cause agnostic or area agnostic. The theory is that there is a shape of problem that is in a bad fit for academic settings and a bad fit for for-profit settings. And there are many of these bottlenecks that we can unlock. That's it. <laughs>